Chris Helser is the Nature Conservancy's Director of Science in Nebraska. His main role is to evaluate and capture lessons from the Conservancy's land management and restoration work and share those lessons with other ranchers, farmers, and other land managers. He also worked to raise awareness about the value of prairies and prairie conservation through photography, writing, presentations, as well as through his blog, The Prairie Ecologist. Thank you, everybody. Um, I will, just before I start, I'm curious how many people here uh, have read my blog? Raise your hand just so I can. Awesome. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Keep your hands up. <laughs> okay, you'll never know which photo I show my boss. Um, okay, well, thank you for having me. This is great. Uh, I want to start out just real quick about the, the Prairie Conference in 2022 that'll be in Lincoln. For those of you who weren't here the other night, uh, we're really looking forward to it. It's three years from now. Uh, we we want to get back on the every other year schedule and be on the even years because the American Grasslands Conference is on the odd years, and so we're, we're, we couldn't do it a year from now, but we can do it three. If somebody else wants to host it next year or the year after in between, that would be great. And there's no reason you can't, but we're going to do it in 2022. Uh, and it'll be a great conference. We've got a lot of neat stuff in, in Nebraska. Um, I mentioned the other night, Prairie Plains Resource Institute is a small nonprofit that plants 1,000 acres of prairie a year around the state uh, with you know, really diverse seed mixes. Um, we've got the Sand Hills in Nebraska, which is a great place. We're going to try to get a field trip up there. It'll, it'll be a fun, a fun, worthwhile trip. OK. Uh, I'm here to talk about two different topics today uh, that I hope will connect together fairly well. And I want to start with ecological resilience. And this is going to be, I hope, not like a, a lecture, but I do want to cover a little bit of information on background and make sure we're on the same page about what resilience is about. So there's a lot of terms associated with this, like multiple stable states, stability regimes, state and transition models. All those are associated with the kind of ecological resilience I'm talking about. But what I, what I want to, when I, when I talk about it today, what I'm referring to is the, the, the sort of capacity of a prairie or any community to uh, maintain its function and its essential processes when, when disturbances happen. Um, so a way that I always talk about this is a ball in a bowl. So if you imagine the prairie is a ball rolling around inside a bowl, stability doesn't mean that the, that the prairie is always the same, right? Stability means that it can maintain all those processes in the same way. It still, it still has that, that set of functions or processes. So even though disturbances can move a ball around in the bowl in different places, the prairie can look differently from time to time, different species will be dominant or rare, um, it's still the same community, it's still the same system, it still has the capacity to provide all the things that it provides. Um, if we push a prairie too hard through disturbances that we do or something else happens, it can leave that bowl and go into another bowl, which is also a stability regime. It can still be, be stable within that, within that regime, but it's not the same thing it was before. Okay, so an example of that would be this, right? We can push a prairie, turn it into a crop field. It's not a prairie. Um, at some point with tree encroachment, that becomes not a prairie anymore, becomes something fundamentally different. It's, it's again, not, not necessarily good or bad, although in this room I think we would vote, um, but it has its own set of processes and things. And, it, and it's really hard to go backwards. Right? You're, it's really difficult to go back to exactly the same bowl that you were in before. Um, there are some really fuzziness, there's a lot of fuzziness in how this works, right? So there's a lot of prairies that are degraded slowly over time, and I feel strongly that at some point you can degrade a prairie to the point where it's left the bowl. Uh, but how to prove that is really difficult, but you know, just experiences with things like, and I'm sure you've done the same, you have a prairie that you manage it really, really well, but it just never gets the diversity of insects or plants or whatever back that you know it used to have. Uh, to me, that's a good sign that that prairie may be in a different bowl now. And we have to try to either work within that bowl or exert extraordinary pressure to push it back into something that's closer to what we wanted before. Okay, so our job as prairie managers is pretty simple, right? Keep the ball in the bowl. And there are a couple different ways, there are three different ways I want to talk about really quickly uh, for how to build and maintain resilience in prairies. Uh, one is, is simple, simple, it's species diversity. And I'll talk more about this in a second. But basically, 
the more species you have, the more redundancy there is in function. So if you have a species that winks out or isn't able to do its job, you've got others that can kind of fill in behind it. The size of habitats is important. The larger area you have, the bigger populations you can have, the more resilient or, or viable those individual populations are. And as you get a bigger area, you get a lot more microclimates and my, my, you know, minor habitat types. So there's redundancy built in there. If you're a species that likes to be on a south-facing slope, there's gonna be multiple south-facing slopes probably on a bigger area. And then connected to that or <laughs> associated with that is connectivity. Um, where you can have you know, smaller areas, but if, if there's connectivity together, that, that increases resilience. So all this is relevant to climate change, because what I'm really talking about is resilience to climate change uh, for the most part. So climate change is coming. It's here. It's, we can see the effects of it. Um, you know, more intense, more frequent droughts are going to be a big part of, of what we deal with here in the Great Plains, for sure. Um, but also, as we see right now, it's, we can go the other direction. We can deal with flooding and, and excess wa water. Um, this, was, this was just last week in our uh, prairies along the Platte River. So I'm actually pretty hopeful about this overall. I mean, there's, there's major challenges coming, and, and the biggest ones are going to be as we have increasing overall warming, there are going to be some species that are no longer adapted to where they're at now. And figuring out how, to, how those species can move around in new places is going to be a major challenge. The nice thing, though, is in those sites we have, prairies tend to be pretty resilient. We have a lot of diversity, a lot of inherent resilience within the prairies as they are now, especially the ones that are in really good shape. And I think that's, there's a lot of hope there. And I wanna, I wanna sort of give an example of why I think that. Um, so one way I think about resilience and, and species diversity and the importance of it is this idea of bench strength. Um, some of you probably read the blog post I wrote on this not long ago, but the idea is that you know we have this sort of second team in waiting, or we've got species that are playing minor roles a lot of times, and then something happens, and all of a sudden they jump up and they play a major role. This is an example in the Nebraska Sandhills where after the 2012 drought, which is the worst single-year drought in Nebraska recorded history, um, we had 12 million acres of sandhills that, that just turned yellow the next summer with sunflowers, annual sunflowers. And they filled in where a lot of other species fell down, and they provided food for wildlife and cover, and they provided animal forage for livestock, all kinds of things that other species weren't able to provide for that year. They also scared the crap out of a bunch of ranchers, but it, it turned out fine. Everybody relaxed. It was good. Um, <clears throat> this is a site. This is a restored prairie, one of our Platte River prairies, very diverse restored prairie. We grazed the snot out of it for an entire field season, and the next year it looked like this. And you can see some grasses in there. There's warm season grasses that are in good shape, but they're really weak temporarily because of the grazing. So they're you know knee high or, or shorter. And in their place, we filled in with all these really colorful forbs, and it provided a bonanza for, for wildlife and pollinators and lots of other things. A year later, this was all tall and grassy again. It, it's a quick recovery. Um, sometimes the species that fill in are not uh, the favorite species of people. They're not always charismatic species. This is western ragweed after a year of grazing. Um, but it's also temporary. And sometimes they're really spectacular. Um, so it just, it just depends on the scenario and it depends on the occurrence. It can, it's different every time we, we look at it. But the, uh, the, the overall point here is that there is that bench strength, there is that value in species diversity. Something can always fill in when we need it to. Um, there's also resilience within individual species. I, I'm guessing everybody in the room has, ha, has a story they can share about a, a plant species that was thought to be gone or an insect species that was thought to be gone from a prairie for lots of years and then something changed in the management or a weather event changed and all of a sudden it was there again. Like, where did that come from? Um, and a lot of that we don't understand, but we know it exists, which also gives me hope. There's, there's some really in, important parts of ecology there that are, that are functioning well. So, if you haven't seen this paper, I'm going to talk about it briefly, but if you haven't seen it before, I really encourage you to read it. Please take a picture of this. It's a nice, nice citation. I'll give you a minute to take a picture before I move to the next slide. Um, John Weaver was a you know, prominent uh, Nebraska, University of Nebraska ecologist of prairies. Many of you probably heard of him. Um, Frederick, Frederick, I think, Albertson was... Uh, a grad student of his that went on to be his own a professor in his own right. They worked together on this paper after the Dust Bowl years of the 30s. Uh, they they were studying the prairies during the Dust Bowl, and then afterwards they have they published this monograph on a bunch of observations and data they collected about the recovery of prairies after that was over. And it's really fascinating. It also is I think a really good source of hope to see what those prairies went through and how they look today. So during those years, the 30s, especially 33 through 40, 39 or 40. Um, big blue stem Indian grass, the, the high quality, tall, 
grass is that everybody associated with those prairies really decreased uh, in a scary way for a lot of people. And they were replaced by things like western wheatgrass, blue grandma buffalo grass, annual bromes, six weeks fescue, all perfectly fine grass except maybe the annual brome. Um, and western wheatgrass in particular took over entire prairies. Like you would walk out there and it looked like a monoculture of western wheatgrass, completely alien to somebody like John Weaver who had been studying prairies his whole career and thought he kind of knew what was happening. Um, and it just became dominant. And this is, uh, it's important to remember, this is before smooth brome, right? Smooth brome was being introduced about this time. The, the, these years were one of the reasons that smooth brome got the popularity it got because it showed itself to be resilient to drought and to maintain forage quality and things like that during drought. So if this happened again today with the prevalence of smooth brome, we'd probably see some different things. But the point is still the same in terms of the kinds of things that happened. Um, during those years, the Forb community changed dramatically. Things like heath aster, which I'll talk about again in a second, Missouri goldenrod, white sagewort, daisy fleabane became much more prevalent in prairies, uh, sometimes to a scary degree. Forbs that had underground storage organs did better than others. Um, and then there, of course, annuals and biennials went crazy during this period because they were given an opportunity because of the weakening, weakening of the perennials around them. So all of these kind of weedy species that uh, we tend to get upset with when we see them in our prairies or in the road ditches or whatever, took over and did a, and kind of filled in. There were some incredible numbers here that he shared in the, in the paper, um, you know, 700%, 600% increase, 800% or 1800% increase in Russian thistle or tumbleweeds, which is a perfect visual for what those years look like, right? Just imagine these tumbleweeds going by. Um, and overall, annuals increased by, by sixfold. Um, so heath aster was an interesting one. I, there's lots of these anecdotes and stories and, and in the paper. I really encourage you to look at it. But heath aster was an interesting one because, so aster multiflorus is the old name for heath aster. So it spread widely, uh, dense, tangled, weedy growth. It got to the point where uh, many of the prairies, prairies were considered to be ruined in terms of hay production because it was so brushy with this, this heath aster that was growing taller than they'd ever seen before. Um, and they actually broke out a lot of native sod because they just thought it was, it was destroyed at the time and it all gone to this plant that nobody liked back then, um, which is a you know, really sad thing. Now, what the thing is funny, the next comment that it made, it just made me laugh when I first read it, which is, yeah, it did protect the soil. You know, nobody likes your heath aster really and it was, it was kind of a mess, but it did kind of protect the soil. All right, thanks for that. Um, but, then, but then grasses recovered and, and you know, after, after the, the drought was over, um, prairies came back, perennials came back, grasses came back. There was a really interesting story, I thought, about blue-eyed grass or white-eyed grass, Sysyncrium compestra. Um, they didn't see it at all from 1934 through 1940. It was gone. Nobody could find it anywhere um, during those years at all. And then in 1943, they, it, it all of a sudden was everywhere. And they gave some, an example from one particular site where they went out and collected data with square meter plots, and they were finding 200 or more plants per square meter of this little blue-eyed grass, which I've never seen anything like that. Um, and apparently, they had never seen anything like that. But the recovery was beginning, and, and it, was, it was beginning in spectacular ways. And they show examples of this with other species, too. But this is just one that was particularly interesting, I thought. So the point is that all the prairies we see today in Nebraska, surrounding states, anywhere that went through that kind of, that intense drought for multiple years, all those prairies made it through that and have recovered, right? Which I think is a source of great hope or should be for us, uh, that, they can, that they can do that and maintain their diversity. So climate change is gonna bring a lot of variability. Um, things are gonna be crazy, they're already crazy. But the nice thing is that that's kinda what prairies are all about, right? I mean, prairies, if, if, if nothing else, prairies are good at, at, at handling variability. And so I think that bodes well for their success. And I'm not saying that climate change is gonna be easy. There are tremendous challenges for all of us with climate change. But I just think in the back of our minds as we work through that, we need to keep this in, in there too, that, that these, these prairies are gonna be really helpful in terms of getting themselves through it. Um, and, and you know, along the way, if, if we're gonna build that resilience, remember those three things, right? Maintain species diversity, prevent habitat loss, uh, build connectivity where we can, and that'll, that'll help those prairies do what they can do. Uh, to do that, we need the, the public support, right? And there's been a lot of discussion at this conference, which I'm glad to see there's gonna be more today about this idea. And this is sort of the transition to my second part of the talk, all right, which I hope will we'll connect together. Um, so 
just for a second, envision prairie in your mind, right? Bring up a picture of what prairie is to you. And probably it is something like an expansive landscape, Nebraska sand hills. It might be distinctive bird communities, uh, maybe bison. It could be floral diversity. There's lots of things that we as a group of prairie people think about, right? What do you think most people think about when they think about prairie? What comes to their mind? Snakes. I like snakes. That's a good one. Most of the people I talk to, I think, just assume it's a bunch of grass, right? These flat, boring areas of grass. Um, nothing's really happening out there. And especially if you don't know species identification, you don't know what's there. You can't identify with anything. There's nothing to associate with. Why would you go there, right? The problem is um, that nobody's going to fight for something they think is boring or uninteresting, right? So that's the key, that's the key problem in terms of us getting public support, is, is getting people to recognize that prairies are something other than just this boring landscape with nothing interesting. And because not everybody lives near a prairie like this, or has a chance to go out and you know, sit in the middle of a herd of bison on a large prairie, we've got some challenges in front of us, but every prairie has things that are interesting. You know, every prairie has diversity and dynamism of some kind. Even a degraded prairie has a lot of different things in it, and it changes over time. Um, and every prairie has things like bees, or katydids, or jumping spiders, or butterflies that, that people can recognize if they have a chance to. So a lot of the work that I do with my photography is to get people to recognize the diversity of prairies, for sure, but also I want to introduce them to individual species so that they feel like they know something about those species uh, because I think it's important so that when they go to a prairie, there's Ray, uh, when they go to a prairie, they see something they recognize, and it's like, oh, there's a connection. And then, and then from there, they can build an, an enjoyment and appreciation of prairies. But if they go there and they don't see anything they recognize, that's hard. The other reason it's important is that familiarity breeds empathy. So when you hear about a disaster somewhere in the world, uh, in a far off place, we all feel bad, right? But it's like, eh, it's kind of far off. It's hard to know how to feel exactly. But if you happen to know someone in that place, or even if you've heard of someone that lives in there, there's a celebrity or you have a pen pal or there's an old friend that you heard maybe moved out there, that changes your degree of empathy. It changes how important that, that, that story is to you. And you start to care a little bit more, maybe even enough to take action. So when we have people that see stories about or hear stories about prairies being at risk or disappearing or having problems, we want them to associate something with that, right? We want them to think about something that they've seen something about either, or either in person or just in a blog or some crazy place like that and, and have a picture that pops up in their head to make it more real. I think that's a really important part of, of getting people to care about prairies. Which brings us to my square meter project, uh, which is what I'm going to sort of end this with. So there's a little tiny piece of prairie in Aurora, Nebraska, uh, planted by Bill Whitney and Prairie Plains Resource Institute back in the early 80s. Uh, this particular place is just a narrow little strip of it. This was early in Bill's work with prairies, so it's not the most diverse restoration in the world, but it's, it's nice. It's typical of what you could find in a lot of different urban prairies or, or just little places anywhere in the Midwest and Great Plains. And January 2018, I had this weird idea and I went out and I put four flags in the ground marking out a square meter of, of land. And I thought, you know, it would be kind of interesting to fill my blog with some, I, need, I, need, I always need things to write about in the blog, right? Um, I try to write twice a week, that's a lot. Um, and I thought, oh, this would be something I can, you know, fill space with. So I, I laid out the square meter plot. I tried to put it in a place where I knew there was going to be some interesting plants and hopefully some interesting insects to take pictures of. And I thought, eh, we'll see what happens with this. And then. Over that year, I went out there as often as I could do it. Um, it was nice that it was right across town. I could skip over there anytime the light looked good. And uh, I got started. So I went 46 times. I spent an average of 30 minutes, but that varied widely from just a few minutes to an you know, hour or more. I never left without taking pictures. There was always something to take pictures of, which was great. Um, during that time, I found a lot of things, and, and I want to emphasize here, this was not a science study, right? I was not trying to document how many species live in this square meter. I wasn't taking, I wasn't setting up traps. I didn't have camera traps. I wasn't digging into the ground to get invertebrates and soil, and soil fauna or anything like that. This is just, what, what, did, what could I see? And even more than that, what could I photograph? So there were a lot of things that I saw that I didn't get photographs of because they moved too fast. There was a little rabbit that hung around a lot, and I never got, never could find it. You know, there was a vole trail right through the plot, and I, I saw the tail end of the vole one day, and that was it. This was, this was about, as an as a observer of prairie, if I just focused on one little place, what could I find? And I found 
113 species that I could photograph over that year, which I was shocked by, honestly. Um, so within that, there are 15 species of plants, which I know is not impressive to some of you more productive prairie folks, but for me, that's pretty good, especially in an older restoration. Um, 22 different kinds of flies. There were 18 different kinds of beetles. There were 14 different kinds of bees, and there were 44 other species of plants and insects that I was able to find, and one, one, one vertebrate. Um, so a couple of quick stories about how this process went. Uh, butterfly milkweed was the plant I was probably most excited about for this because I thought this is going to be great. It's going to bring in all lots of pollinators. I know that butterfly milkweed is great for pollinators. Um, so when it started to bloom and I, I went there a lot and I, and I waited around and as I walked into the plot, I walked by all this butterfly milkweed just full of butterflies and bees and lots of things. Um, in my plot, I photographed one insect on butterfly milkweed. <laughs> And it wasn't for lack of trying. And I think as a result of that, I got one pod, one seed pod off of the, off the plants that were there. There were two big branches of the plant, lots of flowers, got one seed pod. And when that pod opened, I was there every single day making sure that I got the seeds photographed because I wanted to make sure I got that. Um, stiff sunflower is one of my favorite plants. It's just a phenomenal plant. Um, and great for pollinators, so I had high hopes for that too. This is the only photo I've got of stiff sunflower in full bloom because see that little beetle right there? Uh, we'll get to that. Now, this, that's not the beetle here. This is actually, a, this is a weevil that, that decapitates sunflowers and other species and then it lays its eggs in the head and then the head drops off and the larva pupate and all this stuff happens. It's a really cool process. Uh, a little disheartening when you'd only have a few stiff sunflowers in your plants and you were counting on them. More disheartening than that was that little beetle that we saw in the first picture because it came in crazy high in abundance. And it basically demolished every single sunflower in my plot and the surrounding area uh, within a, a, just a couple of days. Uh, every time a flower would bloom, they were right there on top of it. Which again, interesting, great ecology. Uh, it just limits the number of pollinators that I got to take pictures of because all the flowers look like that pretty quickly. Um, yeah, you don't have to sigh, it's okay. <laughs> Everything worked okay, I appreciate that. Uh, I can no longer move slides. Nope. Oh. There it is, okay. Um, now, fortunately, Maximilian Sunflower st uh, stepped up and filled for me, just like we were talking about with bench strength. Maximilian Sunflower, lots of, lots of flowers, lots of insects, it worked out great. Um, this little creature here, if, does anybody know it? Don't, don't say it out loud, but does anybody know what this is? Just raise your hand. Okay, good, I feel better. What I thought it was was the exoskeleton of some little creature, right? That's what it looks like. It's empty, right? There's nothing in there. It's transparent. You can see right through it. And I thought, well, this is great because it's sitting still. It's dead. I can just take a picture of it. And I took my time. And I got about three or four pictures in, and it started walking. <laughs> and I thought, I've just discovered the first zombie insect in the world. I'm going to be famous. And I found out later it's, it's a derbid plant hopper. Um, it's a really cool insect, very interesting. Uh, but it's not a zombie. Tree frogs. Tree frogs are moving west across Nebraska, which is both good and bad. It's really neat to have tree frogs, but it also means that the reason they're moving is because we're getting more trees spreading across the state. Um, but I had never photographed a tree frog before. I have friends that have them on their, on their windows and their, and their door screens and things, and they'll call me and say, hey, we've got tree frogs. It's like, that's great. But by the time I get there to photograph it, it's gone. So the first time I ever photographed a tree frog was in the square meter plot project, which was just, I mean, a shock to me. Um, so I photographed the heck out of that little frog from every direction and an angle that I could come up with. I played with that little frog for about 15 minutes. He was, he or she was very accommodating. Um, this is also the first photo I ever got of a lynx spider, which lynx spiders have these really neat hair. Uh, you can see those long, stiff black hairs on their legs. And I'd seen them, but I'd never photographed one before. So that was neat that it happened within the plot. Uh, I found this really cool little fly that I had never seen before. Just tiny, tiny little fly. And then the fun thing was I got to know some of these creatures, like that little spider. I saw it or something like it several times and I got to watch it, its behavior, including catching and eating that same little fly that I just showed you, <laughs> which was great. I got to watch it happen. I got to photograph parts of it. Um, there was a jumping spider that I got to know a little bit too. <laughs> They're really fast, the jumping spiders. Um, so. I was trying to decide whether I was gonna count this in, in the species count or not, because it's like, technically I did photograph it. Um, 
And then, but fortunately, I, on a later trip, I got a, another chance at capturing the same photo and I was able to photograph it in a better way. And I got to watch it hunt, just like the, the lynx spider, and it was successful. So that was kind of fun to watch too. I, got, I mean, it was just this really neat personal experience with me and the spiders and other insects and the, not other insects, but other creatures. I included this photo because one of the things that I didn't expect to get out of this project was um, it changed the way that I admire prairies, which I didn't think was possible. I'm a pretty big proponent of prairies. Um, but, but when I photograph, I normally do it by walking around pretty actively looking for things to photograph. I'm a very active walker. And having to sit down and, and stare at a little plot is, I mean, it's like a Walden moment would be one way to describe I don't know how to describe it. But it was really, it was really transformational for me. And I, I, I put this picture up here because this is a great example of how I was forced to slow down and wait for something to show itself in the one area rather than going to look for other things. So I was taking pictures of, the, 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 of leaves like this in, in May because not much was blooming yet. And I was trying to find something interesting to take pictures of. So I found these backlit leaves and I would sit and focus on them. And then while I was taking this Maximilian sunflower leaf picture, I noticed that there were ants moving up and down, probably looking for extra floral nectar, which was fun. And I thought, well, at some point, one of those ants is going to walk across this leaf. And I'm going to catch it. But it took about 10 minutes for that to happen. So I was sitting there staring, and it's, just, it's not how I do things, right? I'm not a wildlife photographer because I don't want to lay down in a ground blind and pee into a bottle for two days waiting for some bird to come into the frame. That's not, that's not me, okay? The people that do that are, are really cool, but it's not me. But, but I didn't mind waiting for 10 minutes for an ant to come across a leaf. So now I've learned something about myself. But it was really, it was really neat. So kind of the upshot of this project, um, I mean, obviously, first thing that I think is valuable for a lot of people to know is there's a lot that happens within a small area of prairie, right? And it's not that all those 113 species live their lives within that square meter, but they, they come through at some point, which is fun. Um, anybody could do this. Anybody could see the things that I saw. What I saw in that prairie were not unique to that prairie. Uh, I mean, maybe the particular species of spider is going to be different than the particular species of spider around here. But if you go to a small prairie in Houston or Missouri or uh, Ohio or anywhere else, you'll find the same sorts of things that I find if you want to, which means it's accessible to everybody, which I think is an important part of the, the project. Um, so I'm hoping that that builds a change in perception for people and that they'll see prairies a little bit differently. We're trying to figure out how to, how to market this project in a way that will get it in front of the most people we can to, so, to, to have them get that, that sort of appreciation. Um, and then again, it, it changed me in a way that I didn't expect because I, I thought that I had a pretty strong appreciation of prairies, and I do. Um, but I have more now than I did before, which was really gratifying for me personally. Um, this, is, this is my attempt, or one of my attempts, to connect with people. But there are lots of ways to do this. And so the challenge here is, I mean, have you thought about, can you think about ways that you can use your interests, your talents, uh, your perspectives to do something like this with whatever audience of people that you want to reach out to? Um, you don't have to sit with a camera and wait 10 minutes for an ant to come across the frame to be, to be successful in that, right? So that's what, I'm, what I hope is that all of you take a few minutes and think about what can I do that would be like this that I can share my, my love of prairies with other people. And I'm going to end with this with a video of just a whole bunch of slides from this. It's about a five minute video, so I apologize for the length of it. I had, tried to add music which will hopefully work to make it a little more interesting to watch. Um, and the, the photos go by fast, okay? So I posted a video similar to this on the blog, and a lot of people were upset with me because the photos went by so fast I didn't have time to look at them. My answer to that is that's kind of the point, okay? I want you to appreciate how much I was able to photograph and find in that little square meter. So uh, here we go.